It looks like I need candy, right? <coughs> So we continue in our, uh, in our series, The Expected One, and we get to uh, this Sunday when we take a look at uh, the promise of his life. Now, Jesus came as a baby, and we celebrate that this time of the year, but we all know he didn't stay a baby, like all of us. We're born as babies, but we grow up. We become adults, teenagers, and, you know, young children. And we grow up and we become adults and we live our lives doing what we need to do. And that's what Jesus did. He lived his life, and when he was around 30 years old, he began his ministry. And you know, his ministry among us was a short period of time, about three years. But in those three years, he did some wonderful things. Stories are in the New Testament, especially throughout the Gospels, the stories of the things that Jesus did, the words that he said, the miracles that he performed. And so we want to take a look at what the Old Testament, the prophets, tell us that we were to expect when Christ came. And... We go to the first one. We, we talk about putting our trust in Him. And I, I you know, this is a, a nice image of the trust that the children have for their parents. You know, they'll jump into your arms, they'll jump down and, and trust that you'll catch them. I know when my kids were little, we used to love to throw them up in the air and catch them. And they trusted that I wouldn't miss which was not a smart thing, because I'm pretty clumsy, but I never did drop one. Uh, unless we were like close to the couch and I could drop on the couch and they thought that was fun too. But you know, children inherently have that trust in a parent that they're willing to just let themselves go and trust that that parent will catch them. Whether it's mom or dad, even grandparents, even grandpa, they know inherently that there is a love there that doesn't want them to be harmed. And Jesus came to show us that trust in the way that he lived. Throughout his life, he put his trust fully and totally in God. And as we read through this, uh, this passage of Isaiah, it talks about the time when the kingdom will come and how things will be different and how our trust will be even more implicit as we look to understand what God has got in store for us. And we have the stories of how things will so much change. The lion and the lamb together, the, the ox and the, and the bear, they don't, you know, they're not afraid of each other anymore. They're, they trust because God's kingdom has come. And Jesus came to live his life and to let us know what the kingdom could be like and would be like when it finally came on this earth. Trusting in Him. He also came to show us what God feels for us. And we've all seen this image of, of the shepherd. And it's, it's an appropriate thing for us to think about today because this is Shepherd Sunday in one of the ways of looking at the different Sundays of Advent. This is the Sunday that we celebrate the shepherds. You know, and we have such a, a wonderful image of the shepherds from, from things like this and pictures of Christ, the good shepherd who, who cares for his flock and takes care of them. But you know, you get right down to it, shepherds of that time were not exactly looked at as the loving characters that you see in this picture. They were a rough and tumble bunch. They were not the kind of guys that you'd want to meet in the dark alley, truthfully. They had to be. They were out in the field by themselves with 100, 200 sheep. And there were all these things around that really liked the taste of sheep. You know, like bears, and wolves, and mountain lions, and stray dogs. And they had to protect those sheep, generally speaking, with a stick and a sling. Now, a sling is a pretty good weapon, but, you know, it doesn't hold a candle to a double-barrel 12-gauge. But they had to protect their sheep. And 
sometimes it meant putting their own lives at risk. But they did that. They did that. And it always just kind of makes me stop and think that the first people after Mary and Joseph that God chose to reveal who was coming, the first people were the shepherds. You know, now it doesn't make sense to me if I was doing that, I'd, I'd have let, you know, some of the, the learned men of the time, you know, the wise guys, the ones that knew the stuff, that, that had read the Old Testament and knew all of these things, that, that's the ones that I would have sent the messengers to. But God doesn't do things the way I do, which is really a very good thing. Uh, God does things the way that God knows is the best. And the prophet Micah had said this about the coming Messiah. He said, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Throughout his time on earth, Jesus reminded his disciples and those that followed him that he was the great shepherd. He was not embarrassed to take that title and to say, I am the shepherd of the sheep, the one that God sent to take care of his sheep, all of us. And so the prophets foretold that this coming Messiah would be a shepherd. And you know, that meant that he would be strong, that he would be powerful, he wouldn't be afraid, but also in order to take care of sheep, you have to be gentle. Shepherds were kind of a, a dichotomy because they were rough and tumble and they could take care of themselves, but they could pick up a lamb and nurse it back to health. They could calm a sheep that was afraid or scared of something. They could do that. And that's what Jesus came to show us. He came to show us that he too is like that great shepherd. And that's a wonderful thing because, well, the scriptures remind us we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all wandered from the path. And Jesus came to say, even when one wanders away, that one is still important to God. And that brings us to the next one. He is our rescuer. We see here the, uh, the image of him with, uh, with Peter who... You know, Jesus walking in the water, and Peter said, I can do that. And jumped out of the boat and uh, didn't get too far and started to sink because he quit focusing on Jesus and down he went. But Jesus pulled him up. Well, he's not the only one that's rescued by Jesus. When Jesus comes and brings that rescue to us, he will make sure that we don't end up sinking. And that's a wonderful promise. The prophet Zephaniah says this, um, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. He's mighty to save. Jesus came and, and helped us to see that he was looking to be the rescuer for all of us. You know that world famous scripture John 3.16 reminds us that Christ died so that we would have eternal life but while he lived he also brought rescue to many who had wandered from the path who had strayed away and he brought them back onto the path and gave them rescue so that they wouldn't be lost he cares about us and wants to rescue us all now, this last little piece that, uh, that we look at about Jesus is, is interesting because we have this image, and I believe it's Salzman is the artist, Salzman's head of Christ. If you've ever seen a painting of Jesus, that's the painting you'll probably remember. He looks very distinguished, he has his nice long beard, long hair, and he looks like, you know, a good looking version of any of us. He looks like a white Anglo-Saxon. But the scriptures tell us that he was humble and plain, that he was not anything that people would 
take special notice of. Not that he was ugly, but he wasn't anything special, you know? He wasn't like Robert Redford or Paul Newman. He was like those guys that are in the movie with Robert Redford and Paul Newman, whose names we can't always remember. And they're not bad looking, but they're just sort of plain. They just kind of blend into the background. Jesus was that kind of a person. Um, Zechariah says this about the coming of the king. Rejoice, O daughters of Zion. Shout, daughters of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the pole of a donkey. A plain man, not, not a ruler, not something that is powerful and strength-bearing. And in Isaiah, later on from where we were in 53, it, uh, it says this, he said, it says he grew up before them like a tender shoot. He was like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that he should be desired. As a matter of fact, it says he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow, familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Now, it doesn't mean that, that Jesus was not a nice looking person. It just means that he wasn't special in his appearance. His appearance was not what was important. And, you know, I, I love this because so many people think that when they follow Christ, that in, in order to truly be used by Christ, they need to be something special. They need to be. Something that people go, wow. But you know, real honestly, some of the most powerful servants of Christ that I've ever met in my life, if you just saw them on the street, you wouldn't probably notice them. They're average looking. They're not, they're not special. They're not stunningly handsome or beautiful. They don't seem to have any outward things about them that would draw you to them except that inner part of Christ being in them. And that was Jesus. He drew people to him not because he was pretty to look at, but because what he had to say, what he represented was beautiful. And that shone through him so that no matter what he looked like, when people met him, got to know him, and heard his words, they knew he was someone special. He was someone that was unique. He was someone that maybe they could be like. Humble. Plain. Nothing to attract us to him. As a matter of fact, as we get into the Easter season, which isn't that far away, folks, trust me, we'll be reminded that he was despised and rejected. He was forsaken by his friends and by those around him. Just as the prophets remind us. All of these prophecies have been coming true throughout time. But most of what Jesus came to do, is, I mean, along with saving us from our sins, which is a really important thing, he also came to remind us what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. And this passage in Isaiah really is a foretelling of what the kingdom will be like. It'll be a kingdom of peace, a kingdom where there's no trouble, where there's no arguments, where there aren't wars, and there aren't people angry with each other, and there aren't people upset with each other, and, and we don't have sorrows, and we don't have loss. We don't have those things that make us sad in this earth. And the thing that strikes me about Christ's ministry on this earth is many, many times he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't mean that all of a sudden God was going to come back and, and the second coming would happen and all that. He meant every time we understood a little bit of what he was trying to teach us. Every time we loved our neighbor as we would love ourselves. Any time that we did those things that Christ has shown us and asked us to do. Any time that happened, the kingdom of heaven was a little bit closer. 
The kingdom of heaven was coming and he said, I can see bits and pieces of that kingdom. It's breaking through into this kingdom and someday it will break through permanently. Now, many of us believe that's when Christ will come again and that's fine. But I honestly and truly believe that there could come a time when God's kingdom could come on this earth and we could see it. But we need to remember to be like Christ, to, to put our trust in God, to remember He's our shepherd and that whatever it is He wants for us, it's the best. He wants the best for us. He doesn't want to harm us. He wants us to survive and to thrive. And so we need to trust Him as our shepherd. We need to remember that when we do mess up, when we make mistakes, when we fall away, that Christ is there ready to rescue us, to pull us out of the water and save us from ourselves more often than not. And also to remind us that we, as His people, need to have this, this humble attitude. Matter of fact, one of the... Uh, one of the writers of the New Testament put it this way, he being in the very nature of God, chose to empty himself and take on our image. He gave up heaven for us. Now he's not asking us to give up heaven, but he is asking us to give up a lot of the things that we think are important to us. To put God, through Jesus Christ, first place in our lives, not second, not even a co-leader. You know, we got this and this, God, God and something else. No. We need to put God first in our lives. We need to humble ourselves to the world around us, but mostly to God, and to allow Him to work in and through us so that we too could help bring His kingdom the earth. This little section in Philippians is quite often my prayer on a, on a daily basis. Someday, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, Christ has given us an example. He's given us a, a picture of how we could and should live so that that kingdom would come on earth. And the writer of Philippians believed that that day would come. I do too. And whether it comes at the end of time when Christ comes in final victory and we see his heavenly armies coming down and the battles of Armageddon with Gog and Magog and all of those things happen, or if the kingdom just comes on this earth without all of that. However God chooses, that's the day I'm looking for. The day when every tongue and every knee will confess Jesus Christ as Lord. When that happens, no matter what else is happening around, when that happens, God's kingdom will be on this earth we will be living in the midst of it. But until then, friends, we need to just remember that if we can bow our knee to Jesus, if we can <coughs> confess with our tongue that He is Lord, then the kingdom has come to us. At least a little piece of it. And at Christmas time, as we're surrounded by the beauty of the, the flowers and the trees and the lights and, and the Christmas carols that we get to sing and the reminders of what God did for us, that time of the year, it's important for us to remember that Christ showed us how to live, trusting in God, allowing Him to shepherd us, knowing He will rescue us when we make mistakes, and humbling ourselves so that we can be used by Him to bring His kingdom on this earth. So that's my prayer this day for all of us, as we remember God's love for us, shown through a baby who grew to be a man, to show us how we can live 
and bring the kingdom on this earth, even if it's just in a small part, through us. May that kingdom be a part of your life this day. And may you remember to live knowing that the expected one is Jesus. And he is Lord over all the earth. Amen. And amen.